Chapter eighty two of the Women of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine G. Women of History by Anonymous. Chapter eighty two. Elizabeth Hamilton. Born seventeen fifty eight, died eighteen sixteen. Miss, or as she latterly chose to style herself, Mrs. Elizabeth Hamilton, is one of the female writers of what may now be called the last age, whose eruption into literature was about as spontaneous and irregular as well as could be, for there was nothing either in the education she received or in the circumstances of her position to give her any peculiar impulse towards such a career yet she may be said to have registered her name there among the classics of our language if everything else she produced be forgotten as may almost be said to be already the case her cottages of glenburnie at least will live and continue to be read so long as the scottish dialect remains intelligible it is the only work written in that dialect between the era of the poetry of burns and that of the prose of scott which is now remembered of Scottish prose writing, there is no earlier subsisting example until we go back to the sixteenth century. Here it claims the honour of having been the only modern predecessor of the Waverley novels, if not that of having been, in some degree, their model. In so far as its interests and humour lie in the use of the popular dialect, it is probably to be accounted the offspring of Miss Edgeworth's castle rackrent which is the earliest work still surviving in which the comedy and expressiveness to be found in the peculiarities of the irish provincial speech were highly taken advantage of footnote born in ireland about the middle of the last century yet of scotch descent miss hamilton while yet young came to scotland where residing with relations she went through many changes of life she wrote a great many books both on religious and political subjects, some of which changed without retaining attention. But it was otherwise with the cottages of Glenburnie. End quote. This work was begun, we are told, merely as the amusement of an idle hour. She was encouraged to proceed with it, and to extend the plan, by the mirth which the first sheets of it excited, when she read them to a few friends collected at her own fireside. It was not, her biographer further informs us, without considerable distrust on the part of the publisher, that it was committed to the press. Is it indeed the unhappy instinct of publishers, to be thus always blindest to the value, before they come out, of the books that succeed the best? Or is it thought expedient, for the sake of making the better story, that every instance of remarkably successful publication should be set off by being made to fall out contrary to expectation? however that might be the success of the present work was immediate and decided it was universally read in scotland and very generally even in england where its humour could less be appreciated the great demand soon induced the publishers to print a cheap edition and in the native country of the writer it was to be seen in the hands of all classes miss benger relates that in stirlingshire a person named isabel irvine who had been Miss Hamilton's attendant when she was at school there some thirty or forty years before, and to whom, we suppose, a copy had been sent by the authoress, made money by lending it out among her neighbours. It is believed, too, not to have been without effect in making the peasantry ashamed of the indolence and slovenliness which is exposed and ridiculed. Quote, Perhaps few books, end quote, observes a friend and countryman of Miss Hamilton's, in a sketch of her character and her literary and other services to her country, which Miss Benger has printed, quote, have been more extensively useful. The peculiar humour of this work, by irritating our national pride, has produced a wonderful spirit of improvement. The cheap edition is to be found in every village library, and Mrs. McClarty's example has provoked many a Scotch housewife into cleanliness and good order. End quote. Miss Benger thus describes Miss Hamilton's ordinary mode of life after she took up her residence in Edinburgh. 
quote, the morning, whenever her infirmities admitted, was devoted to study. At two o'clock she descended to the drawing-room, where she commonly found some intimate friend ready to receive her. If no engagement intervened, the interval from seven till ten was occupied with some interesting book, which, according to a good Aunt Marshall's rule, was read aloud for the benefit of the whole party. On Monday she deviated from the general system by admitting visitors all the morning, and such was the esteem for her character, and such the relish for her society, that this private levy was attended by the most brilliant persons in Edinburgh, and commonly protracted till a late hour. But it was in the hearts of Inglenock, by her own fireside, when the world was shut out, and its cares and conflicts and pretensions consigned to temporary oblivion, that Mrs. Hamilton was most truly known, and most perfectly enjoyed. Of anecdote she was inexhaustible, and in narrative she dramatized with such effect that she almost personated those whom she described. End quote. Quote, All who had the happiness to know this amiable woman, end quote, said Miss Edgeworth, in a tribute to her memory, which she contributed to an Irish paper soon after Mrs. Hamilton's death, quote, will with one accord bear testimony to the truth of that feeling of affection which her benevolence, kindness, and cheerfulness of temper inspired. She thought so little of herself, so much of others, that it was impossible she could, superior as she was, excite envy. She put everybody at ease in her company, and in good humour and good spirits with themselves. So far from being a restraint on the young and lively, she encouraged by her sympathy their openness and gaiety. She never flattered, but she always formed the most favourable opinion, that truth and good sense would permit, of every individual who came near her. Instead, therefore, of fearing and shunning her reputation, all loved and courted her society. End quote she died on the twenty third of july eighteen sixteen in the sixtieth year of her age end of chapter eighty two recording by christine g in oslo norway the thirty first of october two thousand and twelve